Well, I don't have to say anything. <laughs> um, I really didn't, uh, didn't expect such a great, uh, great introduction, and uh, Ron actually took half my talk. I didn't, uh, I didn't tell him what I was going to talk about today. Uh, when I first decided that I wanted to do a TED-type talk for the presidential address, uh, I had a hard time getting people to stop laughing. And I think it was the same thing that people reacted when they saw the teddy bear movie called Ted. But people laughed at the silliness of somebody named Ted giving a TED talk. So this isn't a TED talk. And for those lawyers in the audience, this isn't intended to be a TED talk. It's not trademarked to be a TED talk. It's TED talking. But I do, like TED talks, have an idea that I, I think is worth spreading, which is where they start. So for me, and again, I didn't plan this with Ron. He didn't have any idea what my presentation was going to be about. But I specifically asked him to do it, not just because I knew he did such a great job with Bob Lagan and he'd say some great things, although um, there were a few of those comments are pretty rude. Um, but that, that Ron uh, is a person to me, like many of us in the audience have for each of us. And there's one person that you can identify in your career that has helped you uh, more than anybody else. And for me, that's, that's Ron. So Ron gave you the, the skinny on the introduction with Bob Legg. And yes, the dog man uh, picked me up and, uh, and convinced me as I was looking for orthopedic um, mentors. But what Ron didn't tell you is that Bob also gave me a little bit of advice. He said, whenever you're going to meet with Ron, Bring something to work on because you're going to be, he's going to be late. He's always rushing around. And I don't remember my first meeting with Ron, but I do vividly remember my second one with him. And I was waiting in his office, and I was waiting, and I was waiting. And this is before cell phones or texting, so I didn't even know if I was in the right place or the right time zone. And eventually an administrative assistant came by and said, excuse me, are you Ted McClough? And I said, yes, Dr. Lindsay would like to speak with you. So they put me on the phone, and he said, Ted, I'm sorry I'm late, but can you give me a ride to the police station? My car's been towed. So this was really my first great lesson from Ron Lindsay, and that is despite the common belief in New Haven and amongst Yale students that you could collect as many tickets as you wanted because the New Haven police couldn't track tickets given to out-of-state licenses, that they could actually, in fact, identify the worst offenders and impound their cars. So I went and I drove Ron over. But I think as Ron alluded to, he really uh, took me under his wing. He, he was a mentor to me just like he was to uh, Bob Legan. Bob Legan's a member of the OTA uh, now and is a traumatologist. And as long as I was willing to endure the weights, I would learn the fundamentals of everything I would need to know about research. And for every manuscript that I prepared, Ron would sit down with me and painstakingly go through every correction with a red ink. And to this day, I use red ink, and there's some people in the audience here who hate to see red ink, because I do the same thing to them. But he would explain every correction to me, so that I would not just see the correction, but I would understand what the logic was behind it. And he even taught me some intangibles, like the politics of doing a research project or naming authorship. He taught me the importance of exercise, um, and that's how I've maintained my salt figure, Ron, because um, we frequently met after hours or during the gym. He showed me the importance of research support, which influenced me significantly. And at the very beginning, it was through the crafty art of midnight acquisition. You're not going to admit to that. But then later on to a much more legally acceptable way of uh, writing grants. After Ron left Houston, it was a big loss to me, um, although I thought it was going to be. But in the end, it really wasn't, because he kept up with me as if um, I were one of his own kids going off to college. Even when I was at residency, he alluded to the fact that he helped me. We worked together. He would fly me out to Houston. We'd work on research uh, articles and fly me back. And he arranged for my most significant um, professional development experience, which is working at the Air Research Institute with Stefan Perrin on fracture healing. And to this date, that's my area of, of uh, research interest. After Davos, I was a very enthusiastic guy. And um, I came back, and I was interested in studying locally applied antibiotics. Both Ron and Lori Donners, who were the attending at UNC at the time, 
use that. But the idea, uh, I wrote up a, a proposal. I couldn't propagate it because I really didn't have the funding and my midnight acquisition skills wouldn't get me far enough to be able to do the research. And so I remember one of my conversations with Ron and I asked him, well, uh, you know, I'm having this issue with, with getting funding. And he said, well, how much do you think it would cost? And I, I threw out a number, I, I lowballed it. I said $500. So Ron did the extraordinary and unexpected. Uh, he actually wrote me a check for $500 personal check. Throughout the years, I frequently remember Ron when I do my own red ink corrections or I coach my own dogmen. They're kind of flashbacks, but, but I remember it. Um, what I remember as much as anything else is that $500 check. And I'm pretty sure he doesn't even remember writing the check. And I asked him not to, uh, and I didn't tell him what I was going to talk about today. So if I asked him now, he probably wouldn't be able to tell you why he wrote that check. But for me, that check has become a measuring stick to make my own meaningful commitments, uh, be that in the form of money, time. Uh, and as I share with you why this is true for me, perhaps you can also think about ways in which you measure your own contributions. Simon Sinek, a management theorist and adjunct to the RAND Corporation, described a concept of a golden circle, which he mostly applied to business. But as I got used to, to familiarize myself with it, I found it to be a useful lens for many of the other things that I do in my life. The golden circle, as he draws it up, looks like a target, with the periphery being the what, the middle portion being how, and the target being the why. And his argument is the tendency is for people to start with what, but the most successful companies, organizations, and leaders start with the why. There, there's a good rationale for that, because most people know what they do, particularly in business. Many know how they do it, but fewer can describe why they do it. He uses Apple as an example because there's a broad recognition that this is a successful company, and they're able to attract a cult-like following with consumers. So if Apple were like most companies, they would lead with the what. And it would sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one. And notice the why isn't to make money. That's a byproduct of the what. Now, this probably doesn't inspire too many people in this room to just go out and buy that Apple computer. And how does this distinguish Apple from other attractive computers like Sony, which isn't even the computer business anymore? Instead, Apple leads with its why. And their pitch sounds like this. Everything we do challenges the status quo. We do this by thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making beautiful products that are simple to use. We happen to make good computers. Do you want to buy one? So this sounds more interesting, doesn't it? It's working from the central core uh, to the periphery. And not only does this make Apple computers more interesting to purchase, but it also makes consumers more comfortable with buying other Apple products. And you can go down the list of Apple's successes. They have a lot of light products on the market that they've done very well competing against. MP3s, televisions, cell phones, tablets. And this supports the next idea that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. It also, for the business, goes beyond the consumer. It allows Apple to focus its message and recruit other people who believe like Apple. And if you've seen any of Steve Jobs' recent stuff, that is truly what he intended to do. So imagine if the railway businesses of the early 20th century, which didn't survive the advent of the airplane, focused on a corporate what, I'm sorry, corporate, a corporate why of mass transportation rather than the corporate what of running a railway, railway business. 
They might even own the airline industry today. So in light of the golden circle concept, when I look to Ron's gift, I know we have plenty of opportunities to fund better projects. And while this was interesting, it wasn't going to provide him many returns. He's a shrewd businessman. So why did he do it? I believe he did it because he wasn't necessarily invested in the what, but he understood the why. And he thought why he thought might be worthwhile. And knowing Ron, as he's demonstrated at the podium, that at his very core, he's a traditional academic. I believe he felt inspired by the enthusiasm I had for research and by the effect that this investment would have on me. So for the past 13 years, I've served on the board of the San Francisco General Hospital Foundation, which is the main fundraising body for San Francisco's Level 1 Trauma Center and Safety Net Hospital. Our board's been very successful over that time, morphing from about $100,000 a year to a $10 million a year organization. And in the past couple of years, has brought in $150 million in a capital campaign for a new hospital building. You might have read in the New York Times that Mark Zuckerberg, who recently moved to the hospital's neighborhood, and his wife Priscilla Chan, who did part of her pediatric residency at SFGH, donated $75 million recently. That was an amazing and transformative gift to that public institution, or any public institution of its kind. It's the largest one ever. And it led to many other great things. But the day after that hit the press, I got a call from my mom, who's here, congratulating our group on the gift. She then apologetically said, I guess that makes my $75 donation pretty insignificant, doesn't it? So my mother, who's retired and lives in Puerto Rico on a very fixed budget, had religiously written a $75 check to the foundation every year for the past 10 years. Initially, to me, this was sort of a sad statement. But after thinking about it more, I told her, you know, Mr. Zuckerberg is worth $40 billion. And that her contribution meant more to her financially than his did to him. See, the importance of her donation wasn't the size of the contribution, but it was the gesture of generosity. So on the heels of this capital campaign, the foundation was approached by the hospital once again and put in a tough position to close a $100 million gap on an electronic medical record. And most of the physicians on the staff felt the EMR should have been purchased a long time ago and was the hospital's responsibility to fund. So when it came to discussing a $5 million a physician-directed fundraising campaign to support the EMR. There was vocal physician opposition against it, with, interestingly, a main reason being that the $5 million was so far short of the target that it was insignificant. But the foundation leadership heard about the proposal, and they were excited. They recognized that it would be immensely easier for them to raise money from big donors if the physicians themselves felt so felt the EMR was so important that they were willing to fund it out of their own pockets, despite the fact they believed the hospital should purchase it. So the lesson here was what seemed small to many of the physicians was really of great value to the foundation. So when Ron wrote his $500 check to me, it just covered the minimum for supplies to do a pilot project. But it was enough to get critical preliminary data, and equally important was extremely motivating to me. I would be sure that every penny was spent appropriately and that there were results at the end of the day. What seemed small and modest on the surface had deep value to me. So in 2005, several members of our trauma group founded the Institute for Global Orthopedics and Traumatology, or IGOT, which many of you are familiar with, and it's dedicated to improvements in orthopedic trauma in lower and middle income countries through sustainable academic partnerships. One of our first projects was to help build a research infrastructure at Makerere University in Kampala, Uganda. The problem there was the residency training program had a resident research requirement, but there was really no research infrastructure or funding to be able to execute any of the projects. In fact, the African residents had to write, underwrite the uh, projects themselves which is basically impossible. So what we decided to do 
was coach them on the front end of the project, make sure they had a good project, let them execute it, and then on the back end, help them develop the project and write it up. And several of us wrote our own $500 checks to support it. So while this approach it was helpful to the graduating students, we found that its long-term impact was relatively modest. And the reason for that was that we weren't really doing anything to improve the expertise of the faculty and support staff who really were the ones providing the sustainability of the program. Over the past five years, we've decided to integrate a clinical research course into a soft tissue limb salvage course <clears throat> that we have in San Francisco. And at this course, we typically get 50 surgeons from 30 different low, lower and middle income countries, so it was a great course to partner with. And the clinical research, research course that we designed focused on the basics of doing research in resource constrained environments. And specifically, we had workshops where each surgeon could develop a protocol for a project cl clinically re relevant to them where they, where they were living. Two of the surgeons attending our very first course, Edmund Eliezer and Billy Haonga from the Muhimbili Orthopedic Institute in Tanzania, were really curious about the massive number of femur fractures that they had come into their hospital and then the outcomes from surgery. They developed an ongoing dialogue with two of our surgeons, Sam Warshed and Dave Shearer, who traveled to Tanzania after the course to help them design a prospective observational study that used a simple database, iPads, and an internet connection to provide real-time data transfer. They also worked with Edmund and Billy to apply to the OTA and the ORF for funding, which they got. And in one year, these two surgeons and their teams enrolled over 330 patients with better than 80% follow-up. There's not a single center in North America that can do that. Further, they submitted the work this year to the OTA meeting and were, were selected as having the best international paper award. And if you're interested in hearing their talk, which I strongly encourage you to do, to do so, they'll be presenting it tomorrow. It's fantastic. It's inspirational. So what we learned from this experience was that different kinds of support at different times make all the difference. Simply giving money to a project isn't going to guarantee its success. The magic formula is providing resources when people are most ready to use them. And given the success of original clinical research courses, we've now partnered with other organizations and put on some ourselves in four different continents, similar uh, to the clinical research course that we gave in San Francisco, and we've been able to touch surgeons from all of these different countries. If Ron were to write me a check today for $500, it would have very little impact on me or any research project that I was doing. Back when he wrote it, though, I really needed it. There was no way I would have been able to do the project without it. And for me, the funding allowed, allowed me to generate pilot data that I used to apply to the OTA for my first grant which I got, my very, very first extramural funding, and it really was my first window to learning how to write and submit grants on my own. So there's no doubt in my mind that 25 years, almost to the day, and seven and a half million dollars in extramural grant support later, that this $500 check played a critical role in my development. So I will leave you with this, the greatest lesson that I have learned from my most significant career mentor. The most satisfying and meaningful contributions are those made towards causes you deeply believe in, to people who need it the most, when they need it the most. And that's my idea worth spreading. Thank you. <laughs>